can I get you, partner? Come on into my saloon. Pull up a chair there, for goodness sakes, please. Do you know where you are right now? Me neither. I'm never quite sure where I am, but if I were to walk outside of this place right now and look at the sign above the door, I believe it would say the Jefferson Avenue Way Station. The station on the way to Jefferson Avenue, which is strange because the place exists right on that avenue. And that's not strange at all. That's, uh, that's what we call appropriate naming, and uh, so I occasionally congratulate myself for that appropriateness. Do you know what we serve here? We don't serve food. We don't serve water. Probably should serve water. Every place should serve water. Water is an indelible right, but we do serve Mac Adams beer. The beer that is, well, I'd say two most scale points away from being a bona fide solid. But it is not solid, it can be drank. And I don't just mean in the awkward way that you might try to squeeze a jello shot out of a plastic cup. No, this can be drank as a liquid. Why? Because it is a liquid and I pour it out of this tap right here. You hear that? If there was a microphone right in front of me, the, it might have been popping a little bit as I hit that with my wedding ring, but it's just the two of us. There might be a microphone in here. I might have said some compromising things, but uh, we need not let on that we are aware of it. However, while you are here, I would appreciate if you gave me some subtle hints to where you might think there might be some Recording devices, not that you would be uh, subversive in such a way, but I'd appreciate it. I'm not going to talk to you like that anymore because uh, that hurts my throat. And also, it is the sort of joke that your father might tell you if he is too exhausted to tell you a clever joke. No, no this, is, uh, this is just me. This is just you, and you're about to get yourself a glass of this stuff. There you are. Right to the line in the cup. Bring it down all the way down your esophagus. Now I'm going to be silent for a while here. I'm gonna just going to look at you and watch as you drink this and see how you enjoy it. Do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy beer? Did you think that there was another sort of beverage here? There isn't. This is the only thing I serve. And it is $10 uh, per each one of those glasses right there. Some think that's a steep price, but... Well, Mac Adams beer cannot be found anywhere else in the world. Actually, that's not true. Reason being, uh, reason I can say for certain that I don't know this for certain is because I don't make this beer myself and the brewer of this beer does not tell me whether or not he provides it to other distributors. He just gives me a keg and that's all of our interaction. One time he did tell me that there was uh, another bar that he sold the same liquid to but he looked downtrodden after that and moseyed on to the into the pub and as last I've heard of it so well if you were here a few weeks ago you might have heard that story but it, it can never be told again just like that man's life that man's life cannot be lived again anyway let's not uh let's not muddy the Mac Adams with uh, sadness and distraught feelings let's just drink it you have to imagine that the best time, the best sensation that you get from eating or drinking anything is that apprehension before it touches your taste buds. The actual feeling of it touching your taste buds is unbearable. And the actual feeling of you swallowing it and 
disgorging it into the cavity of your stomach from the vastness of the atmosphere. That is that is more than unbearable. That is a that is a horrifying feeling. Your stomach actually wants to be empty all the time. It's it craves to be a balloon of of atmosphere. It wants to be an argon flask. And yet you have dumped a bolus into it. And then it splashes around and, has, and it's forced to writhe in confusion. No, that's not the true goodness of eating. The goodness of eating is the hope that you will eat. And then when you're done eating, you understand this truth for a moment. And then you're confused. You think, is this what I wanted? I might as well have another bite. And then you feel that hopeful apprehension again, and that is joy. In the midst of this eating, while you are chewing that one bite and while you are thinking of the next bite, the one that has not been corrupted by saliva or the gnashing of teeth, you are feeling the joy of that future food. The joy is all in your mind, not in your body. Or is it? Well, the Bodhisattva might uh, not agree with me there. That was the truth that he wanted to bring down from the mountain pass of Tibet into the southern reaches of China. He was, he was bringing a, a truth that he had learned far, far away in, in a land that the Japanese called uh, Tenjiku, which I, there's an English word for that, but I did not pay attention in our geography classes. No, I just, I read Japanese manga all throughout high school and uh, had a lot of trouble finding myself a female companion. I blame this, of course, on women in general, but I didn't realize at the time that that was not doing me any favors. So I thought to myself after that, perhaps men of later generations, men and boys of later generations, they need not learn this lesson. They should know it already. Why? Because I know it. And yet, these fools keep making the same mistake, keep having those same apprehensions. And you know what they do with that pain? They turn it into cruelty. They turn it into selfishness. They make themselves into the martyr. Well, you are not the mod martyr. You're not the martyr either, nor the stabat martyr, as the Catholics would say. You are just a child. And you have prolonged your childhood. I, on the other hand, I, I was able to somehow take that pain. And I, eventually I made a business, though I don't know if those two events are connected in the direct sense. No. No, I think I created this business because I one day discovered the existence of Mac Adams beer. Uh, the man who brewed it, he had his own little bar. He thought that that would be the only thing he would have to do in order to run a business. Well, the man did not have the mind of a business. He only had the mind of a brewer. And what is the landscape of a brewer's mind? It is, it is a desert full of steep and precipitous dunes. It is a desert where hard, jagged stones are hidden beneath the sands and poisonous gases occasionally rupture from unknown pockets as they shift like a horrifying bubble, like an octopus breaching from the depths. That the octopi don't generally do that, to be true, but, well, my imagination got the better of me at that moment. In short, the man was, uh, he was still a child. He had been spurned, or at least in his words, spurned as a teenager from the girl that he, I, I believe he lusted after, but he said he loved her. She did not have similar feelings for him. And she, and well, he thought that that made him shallow. 
Did it make him shallow? No, it didn't make her shallow. That's what I'm asking. I'm getting the subjects of this story mixed up. Why? Because it is very hot in this bar. Have you noticed that? The only thing that's not hot is that Mac Adams beer, which is strange because, as you can see, if you look underneath this bar where the keg is sitting, it's not refrigerated. No, that's the unique thing about any sort of room, is usually where your feet are, that is where the cool air is. No energy needed to refrigerate it. I, sometimes this uh, man who made the Mac Adams beer while he was trying to run his business, he would get a little too warm in his business. He would start to sweat and repel any uh, prospective customers. So he'd lie down on the cool floor. He'd try to have that he, uh, that lack of heat seep off of his body from convection. Uh, eventually, that he realized this didn't work, so he replaced all of the floor in his bar with steel grating. You see, because he was a uh, he had an uh, interest in the making of computers, and he understood the makings of a heat sink, which is really just a little metal grill, a little tiny uh, webbed metal grill, like you might see on the outlet of an air conditioner. And he thought, why not on the floor of a bar? You see, because uh, there's no air conditioning here. There's really just a, a tin roof. He, this man thought himself to be uh, technologically minded and engineer minded, but he didn't realize that this roof was not made out of tin. It was made out of corrugated steel. But he was trapped in the past in more ways than one. I tried to tell him the story of my own. Uh, thinking that I'd relate to him and hopefully knock him out of his self-imposed fantasy, I told him that there was a... Oh, now she's a woman, but then I guess you could call her a teenage girl in my high school who I had affection for. I had yearned after, and uh, she did not feel this way for me. She was a kind person. She was a... I, uh, I would call her an empathetic person, but she did not feel physical attraction for every man that felt that same attraction for her. Was she unique in that fashion? No, she wasn't. Most people only feel that attraction for, I'd say, five people in their life. And that number gets lower and lower and lower as you age. As you age, you... Well, you begin to feel very little. And at one point, you don't feel anything. Not even inside your mind. There is a point in which even the feelings inside your brain are gone. And you're just thoughts. You're disensouled thoughts. You're, you're a conscious being, but you do not have emotions. I, I'm, I'm actually relatively close to that. And uh, I'm wait awaiting the next step, which is the extinguishment, or the extinguishing, I, I guess that's the vowel, or the, the, that's the noun. I'm waiting for the extinguishing of those thoughts in general, and then I will be nothing at all. And uh, I began my life trying to grasp this concept of personal nothingness, of obliviation or uh, obliteration rather of the soul and uh, at first it just began with confusion that's how you begin any sort of paranoia I suppose you be you begin it by just not quite understanding it and then you laugh at it because it's a little bit mysterious it doesn't quite make sense and then the terror begins in its most potent form it blinds you, it's traumatic. And then your memories go away. That was my first memory as a child. The very first one. And after that, I didn't remember anything until I was 12 years old. I was in uh, the pantry of my, of my home, my birth place, my, my birth home. I was a uh, slightly overweight, lad. Uh, I mean, I'm overweight now, but I was slightly overweight then. 
and uh, I was uh, trying to get to the place that I am now. I was uh, searching for cookies in this pantry, and I found some. And while I was searching in this pantry, I was searching through space in my mind. I was trying to find meaning, meaning to myself. And I grasped upon the idea that at some point, my life will end and the continuity of my consciousness will come to, well, it will terminate. I will terminate. I will be terminated. And then I thought to myself, well, how can I grasp this state? How will I use my normal mental faculties to evaluate it? And then I thought, well, those won't be there. And then I thought, well, how would I respond to this emotionally? Those emotions will not be there. And then I thought, how will my state exist at all? How will my being exist at all? It won't. There will be no basis. And as I was thinking this, I had already placed the cookie in my mouth that I was chewing it. And thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm already on my way there steadily. I'm expediting this process right now, so I felt the terror there in earnest, in my conscious earnestness. My life really began when I was 12 years old. That's where my memories truly began. That's what, that was when I really started to become an adult. Perhaps this, this brewer of Mac Adams beer, perhaps he, uh, perhaps he just needs to think about death a little bit before he thinks about women or anybody else in his life. Before he thinks about any other human being, he should just think about death. And then he'll just have a existential horror that will last a few decades. And then he'll, he'll be all right. Like me, I, I think I'm all right right now. It just, it just took a long time of pain. And then, I, and then after all that, that long time of pain and confusion, I was still in a little bit of pain, but not so much confusion. Fear is important. Fear is very important. Otherwise, you will be trapped in a confused state forever. The only reason I'm not so afraid of death anymore is because I've thought about it. And the only reason I've thought about it is because I was afraid. And I didn't want to be afraid as you might have guessed, obliviation isn't bad or good. What's truly bad is being afraid of that obliviation. Then there is no purpose of being afraid because it's not bad. And yet, here we are. We are still afraid. Why are we afraid? Well, that is the curse of biology. Do you feel this apprehension? Oh, that oh, that's what you feel. Okay. Hold right. oh, let me let me take that for you. By the way, you you are aware of the price of each glass, right? Okay, here you go. Enjoy, please. But before you bring that glass to your lips, prolong that enjoyment. The apprehension. But not too long, because you see if you extend this sensation too much, you will wear out the nerve of apprehension. And that feeling will be wasted. The apprehension of uh, enjoying a physical pleasure is like a certain type of literature. You can only have it during certain periods of your life as they correspond to those periods. Mac Adams beer, well, I've said this before, it corresponds to a very narrow period in almost anybody's life. Nobody can enjoy it wholly. Not throughout the entire breath of their life because, well, few infants, very few of all the infants on earth enjoy an alcoholic beverage immediately into the nascence of their existence. And no one really wants to drink uh, alcohol at the moment of their death. They usually want water. 
I know this because I've, well, I thought I, d- I was about to die a few times in my life. One time I was sitting on the edge of a cliff, deep in the wilderness of, uh, of Michigan, and I started to slide. And I didn't realize that the fall, well, this, first of all, I had called this thing a cliff in my mind, but it was really a slight slope into a, some rocks a few feet down, but I, I couldn't see them. I couldn't see these rocks. I could just see the vastness before me and felt a horrifying agoraphobia. And I, my heart lifted into my throat, even though I wasn't falling. My brain had tricked me into thinking I was falling. My apprehension had transported me as if it was some sort of hallucinogenic drug. Hallucinogenic drug. There you go. And then someone grabbed my collar and pulled me back. Somehow, knowing that I wasn't in danger, but also knowing that I thought I was in danger. And in that moment, before I realized what truly happened, I thought my life had been saved and I felt gratitude. And before, after I felt that gratitude, I felt the embarrassing realization that I was never in any danger. And after that, I felt indignation. So really, there was a very small period within that whole event in which I felt any positive emotions at all. What are some good things that you felt in horrifying times of your life? Oh, that, that's, uh, that's, that's, re- that's really interesting. I wish I had a life like yours. Very few people on earth have a life like yours. Um, boy, I wish, uh, you know, I, I'm probably going to forget your story. Just because um, I'm a rather selfish person. And I forget many things that people tell me. And uh, I live mostly in the echo chamber of my own skull. I'm a... Uh, I, I really haven't matured much, and definitely I haven't matured as much as I'd like to or as much as I'd like to think I have. No, I'm still living in the fear and confusion of adolescence, even though I'm nearly into my old age. I'm a good way into my middle age and on to my old age. Odd thing about old age is that it doesn't last very long and middle age lasts a very long time it is the one time in which the average persists most people on earth that you look around and see they have wrinkles and wind burns and crags all about their faces they have a, a enormous breadth of horrifying experiences of apprehensions and fears and hopes and anxieties that have racked their face and maybe a few scars from knife fights, but you don't see that very often, thankfully. This would be a very hard life if uh, a knife scar was a common sighting. But as it stands, at least now, when you see a knife scar on someone's face, it's a novelty. It's unusual. And you, uh, it's, it's, not, it's enough of a novelty that you will tell your wife when you come home. You'll say, I saw a man on the subway. He had a scar right from his, from his eyeball, over his eyeball, onto his forehead, and then across his, the top of the, his dome, and all around it looked like it cut right to the skull. And I could see the bone underneath, and his eyeball was all milky, and I wondered... How was his eyeball cut to the point of blindness, but it's still there. It's still, the orb is still intact somehow. It, it had healed, but not enough so that that eyeball was useful. It was just maintaining the structure of the socket. I, I mean, if I, was, uh, if I didn't know what to say right now, if I was not creative... I would have said that people are like that, that some people are damaged to the point in which they can still exist, in which they can still uphold the space that contains them, that they still obstruct light that hits them, 
and will repel light that uh, is reflected off of them, that you can smell them and touch them and remember that they are there, but they do not function as a human being shall. Why? Because of a knife wound, maybe. That's possible. I heard of a man one time who got stabbed in the back, hit him in the base of the spine, never had use in his legs ever again. Someone told me that, and uh, I was waiting for, I guess, an idiosyncrasy in that story. Something ironic or strange, but it was just that. It was just that their spine had been severed by a knife wound. And I said immediately, that's, there's, that's not a good story, that's just tragic. It's like Hamlet. Uh, well, that's the thing. Some interesting things happened in there, and it was also tragic. It was mostly just terrible people squabbling amongst each other, but I guess it was, I mean, there was a ghost in there, I believe. So there you have it. But I don't believe that this uh, knife wound story that this person told me involved any sort of disembodied specters whatsoever. Anyway, I'll have to say goodbye now. You have a good night.